Mr Alex Atwood has been given leave to make a statement on the humanitarian crisis in eastern Aleppo, which fulfils the criteria set out in Standing Order No. 24. If other members wish to be called, they should do so by rising in their places and continuing to do so. All members will have up to three minutes to speak on the subject. I would remind members that I will not take any points of order on this or any other matter until the item of business has been completed. I call Mr Atwood. Uh, could I thank you, Mr Speaker, uh, for uh, uh, permitting uh, this matter to be discussed uh, this morning. And whilst it is the case that foreign affairs is not a devolved matter, uh, issues in other places around the world are very much a concern of people in this chamber in Northern Ireland and on the island. And we know uh, how important it was in our own history that the spotlight was kept upon our experience. And it is very important, I think, Mr. Speaker, to keep the spotlight on the experience in other places in conflict and where there is humanitarian crisis. Um, Aleppo, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, uh, it was historically a place of great commerce and culture. Uh, part of the city was on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Um, it is a city that goes, has a history going back 9,000 years. Uh, and whilst now the situation in the city, especially in uh, eastern Aleppo, is very complex, where no one group is in charge, where the geopolitics is more and more demanding, some things are nonetheless very straightforward and very clear. Because whatever the political situation might be, the humanitarian situation is very clear for us all to see. Over the last uh, two weeks, Mr. Speaker, uh, the city has experienced its heaviest bombardment, eastern Aleppo, in the last five and a half years of the Syrian war. We now have a situation with a population of 275,000 people in that part of the city, with, with only 30 to 35 doctors, 20 or so ambulances, uh, six hospitals, uh, two hospitals destroyed in recent weeks, three doctors and two nurses killed. Um, uh, doctors and hospitals requiring to recycle syringes, needles and bandages. Uh, 35,000 people, over 10% of the population, internally displaced. Uh, last week, Mr uh, Speaker, the UN Special Envoy uh, to the area said that, uh, and these were very crystal, uh, crystally, crystal clear words, that we now had a situation where we had to divert another Srebrenica or divert another Rwanda, that by Christmas eastern Aleppo could be destroyed. We are witnessing uh, the slow death of its people. As one citizen put it, and I'll conclude with these words, this is a city that will die. The entire world is watching a city dying. Aleppo is the third oldest city in the world. It is 9,000 years old. It has seen earthquakes and disasters, but now in the 21st century, the city is being slaughtered and the entire world is watching. I call Mr. Gordon Lyons. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for West Belfast for bringing uh, this matter of the day to the Assembly uh, this afternoon. Sadly, this is not just a matter for this day, but it is a matter of gravest concern for hundreds and hundreds of days as tens of thousands of people have lost their lives as a result of Syrian and Russian bombing of the city of Aleppo. The misery being endured by the remaining 275,000 people in Aleppo is unimaginable, and 100,000 children are at the forefront of that misery. We need to stop and think about that. 100,000 children are suffering in this way. That's horrific, and we cannot help but be moved with compassion for those who are suffering. Mr. Speaker, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon has said that what is happening in Aleppo is worse than a slaughterhouse. Stefan de Mistura, the UN envoy in Syria, has said that at the current rate of bombardment, 
the city will be completely destroyed by the end of this year. And that's why it was very sad to see the UN resolutions last week um, vetoed, which called on the bombardment to stop. That is shameful, and it only prolongs the suffering of the people there. Mr. Speaker, the pain uh, and suffering in Aleppo is unquantifiable. However, there are those medical professionals who are trying to help the wounded and dying and to bring some comfort and relief. They are working in some of the most difficult and dangerous circumstances imaginable. And they should be the focus of aid efforts and relief work itself, which is even being hindered. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank uh, Mr. Atwood for bringing this matter to the Assembly. Although we are obviously very limited in what we can do in this place, it is right that our voices are heard, that we speak against this injustice, and that we pray for the people of Aleppo and for peace there. Thank you. Call Ms. Katrina Rua. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank uh, Alec Ashwood for bringing this matter of the day to the Assembly. We've heard and we all know what is happening in Syria is an absolute humanitarian disaster. Last week alone, there were 376 people killed, half of them were ch children. We had 1,266 injured, hospitals destroyed, medical personnel killed. Civilians are besieged. They're under full military encirclement without humanitarian supplies, without freedom to leave many different areas. We are talking about Aleppo here today and the 275,000 people, but equally, according to the United Nations, there's over 861,000 people in other parts of Syria in similar situations. The UN envoy, spe uh, special envoy for Syria, Staffan de Mistura, has said that the suspension of bilateral discussions between the two chairs, the United States and Russia, on a cessation of hostilities was a serious setback. If we can learn anything about our peace process here in Ireland, and I'm not for one minute equating the two conflicts, every conflict is different. It is, but if there's anything we can learn, it is that there should be inclusive dialogue. It is that there should be a cessation of hostilities by all uh, of the combatants. All sides need to bear responsibility for their actions. We need the hostilities to be brought to an immediate end and all sides need to recognise uh, a new ceasefire. Urgent humanitarian aid needs to get to the people who are suffering in this terrible, terrible war. I would like to pay tribute um, to the international aid workers who are trying to do everything they can to get badly needed supplies into worst hit areas and save lives. We need urgent action. We need urgent action now. And while we don't have uh, responsibility in this assembly for international affairs, we do have responsibility as international citizens of this world to end and um, to help end this conflict. We also have refugees who have come to Ireland um, all different parts of Ireland as refugees and I think what we can say to those refugees here today you are very very welcome in our country and we will do everything we can to help you um, and we're very very sorry about what's happening to your loved ones in your country so the biggest action we can take is international pressure support the UN efforts um, but also support the people who have come to our shores looking for solidarity and support. Call Mr. Doug Beatty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, <coughs> and I thank Mr. Atwood for bringing this to, uh, to, the, to the Assembly. I think we've all seen uh, the horrific pictures which are coming out of, of Aleppo. Uh, we've seen the injured. Uh, we've seen the tragedy, uh, which is the children who are suffering uh, in that city, which has been pounded. Um, to ruins and now being pounded uh, to dust. Uh, but this is more than a tragedy. Um, this is a stain uh, on the international community for taking no action at all for the last four years, four years plus. And what we have uh, in Aleppo is we have the Al-Nusra Front who are fighting against the Free Syrian Army, who are in turn fighting against 
Assad's forces who are underpinned by the Russians. And there's absolutely no doubt about it whatsoever that what we're seeing is a proxy war between the United States and the Russians in Aleppo, between Iran and Saudi Arabia in Aleppo, and the United Nations is absolutely impotent in trying to bring a cessation to this absolute catastrophe, this near genocide. Only recently, the French brought forward uh, a motion within the last few hours for a permanent ceasefire, and yet again, the Russians have vetoed it, which tells you that the system of the five permanent members in the UN Security Council does not work. And therefore, I do call on the United Nations to take direct action to put in humanitarian corridors into Aleppo to allow the wounded to be brought out, to allow the non-combatants to be brought out, to allow the children to be brought out. And then the combatants can kill themselves all the more. Because what you find in any conflict, and I am testimony to this, is that the people who suffer most are the innocent people, the men and the women and the children who live in that what must be hellish place. And again, I thank Mr. Atwood for bringing this forward. Thank you. I call Mr. Stephen Farry. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can I also thank Mr. Atwood for bringing uh, this important uh, matter of the day to the Assembly. At the outset, can I just also make a, a, a reference to the uh, humanitarian situation in Haiti um, due to Hurricane Matthew and recognise the, the hundreds of people who have lost their lives there and indeed the thousands who are now homeless. In some respects, we have a, a man-made hurricane that is uh, affecting the people of Aleppo. And in some regards as well, given our particular history and the fact that this year we're, we're marking the 100th anniversary of a number of major battles in the First World War, such as the Battle of the Somme in Verdun, we know the consequences of what happens whenever a long-term stalemate build builds up. The difference, of course, between those battles and the situation today is that we, have so many, we see so many civilians who are bearing the brunt uh, of the conflict uh, and suffering uh, on a daily basis uh, and losing their lives, losing their homes, losing, losing their livelihoods and their, their futures. Of course, Aleppo is one of the oldest inhabited uh, settlements uh, in the world, and what is happening there is a tragedy in so uh, many respects. But it also reflects the, the much wider situation that is affecting uh, the, the, the country uh, of uh, Syria. And it is important that we do speak out as an assembly on what is happening uh, beyond our borders. What is happening today in Syria in terms of that conflict, I think, is the defining conflict uh, of our age. And we should be defined in terms of how we, as the international community, respond uh, to that, that situation. It is, of, of course, important that we are seeing uh, the humanitarian assistance and that we join in recognising uh, those aid workers who are risking their own lives uh, to, to bring assistance and in doing so, in particular, recognise the role played by the, the White Helmets in terms of the, the actions they're doing in terms of trying to, to save and, and, and rescue uh, lives. But we also have to recognise that it's not just about humanitarian aid. We have wider responsibilities as an international uh, community. It's not good enough to see uh, the great powers intervening on different sides of the conflict and almost this becoming a, some form of proxy war. And in particular, uh, Russia does stand out in terms of inter international condemnation for their particular activities on the ground in terms of the military support they're providing to the regime, the fact that they're also um, bolstering and protecting the regime of Bashar al-Assad. And if, if, frankly, if that support was withdrawn, then there may be some hope of some type of solution. But I fear at present we are seeing a rolling stalemate, and that stalemate is centred around uh, the city of Aleppo. And that is likely to continue unless we see a change in tack from the inter international community, a, united, a genuine united front, a recognition that they have the, the formal responsibility to protect. And what happens within board, national borders is something of all of our concerns as an inter international community. Thank you. Call Mr. Jerry Carroll. 
Mr. Speaker, and the, the scenes, I thank Mr. Atwood for, for bringing the, the matter for a discussion today. And the scenes uh, coming out of Aleppo in the last few weeks have been absolutely harrowing. Uh, kids being pulled from rubble, uh, nobody knowing if they're alive or dead. 275,000 uh, people cut off from water, food, uh, and medicine. Uh, we've also saw a local hospital uh, blown, uh, blown to bits. And, it is a crisis, it is a disaster, but it's one uh, of a political making. And as the death toll raises day by day, uh, I think we must remember that it's not just ISIS, uh, it's not just Assad who is killing civilians, but it's, uh, it's Russia. It's Russia whose air forces are carpet bombing Aleppo. It's Western forces, uh, so-called allies in the US who are also bombing civilians. And uh, Mr. Speaker, in 2011, um, we saw the, the Arab Spring, uh, a movement, an uprising from below across the Middle East for democracy and social justice, which began in Tunisia, spread to Egypt and went across the Middle East. Uh, people in Syria also stood up uh, for freedom and social justice, uh, and Bashar Assad um, met the protests. Um, somebody who was weighed and dined uh, in Westminster, no doubt, was uh, met the protesters with uh, severe repression and brutality on a, on a huge scale, and protesters were gunned down. And at the minute, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the war hawks are swarming around Aleppo and Syria. And truth be told, if you live in Aleppo, Damascus, or anywhere else in Syria, it doesn't really matter if the bombs being dropped uh, were made in Washington, in Moscow, or in London because the death and the devastation and the destruction will be seen for miles around. The result will be the same. And it's worth saying that across the Middle East, the imperial powers have bought nothing but misery for the people uh, in the Middle East and the people in Syria and the people of Iraq. And we should say, hands off, Syria. And they should cease to engage uh, in the terrorism from the sky. I think we also had a mention about Haiti. I think we should also mention what's been happening in Yemen, where in the last few days, uh, 140 people were killed uh, at a funeral, and Saudi Arabia has been engaging in absolute brutality uh, on the people uh, in, in Yemen. So I think, Mr. Speaker, we have to do two things. I think we have to stand resolutely against the destruction and the bombs being dropped in the Middle East and say, not in our name. I think we also have to recognize the destruction uh, that's taken place in Syria and how millions uh, of innocent people, millions uh, of people have been turned into, into refugees. I ask the uh, member to conclude his remarks. I think we'll have to say no to war, no to racism, and open up borders and let the refugees in. Thank you. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Mr. Speaker, I don't suppose anyone in this House is foolish enough to think that the contributions in this debate are going to change very much. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't speak up when we see unfold before us unspeakable horror in different parts of this world. And indeed, when we do see on our television screen what are only snapshots of the uh, terror and horror in Aleppo, I think you couldn't be human and not be moved by the uh, horrendous circumstances prevailing. And to think that there was a ceasefire negotiated and then it was breached by a grotesque act of war in the bombing of all things by the Russians of a food convoy of humanitarian aid it really underscores the depths of degradation to which this conflict has gone. And yes, Western interventions in the Middle East, where there have been many monsters and tyrants in charge, do not have a very good track record. But the situation created in Syria is one as Mr. Beatty said, uh, crying out for effective international action. And he's right. The UN is being exposed only for its impotence in this situation. And 
because, of course, of the Russian veto. But if the United Nations is an organization worth having, then this is a moment when it needs to be providing the humanitarian lead and the delivery to safety of the ultimate innocents, the children of Aleppo. What sort of human beings are we if the United Nations organizations are supposed to protect humanitarian interests in the world, cannot and will not even take that most basic of steps. And so, though today we join in the condemnation, recognizing the limitations to what we say, it is still right that we utterly condemn the carpet bombing of the Russians and others in Aleppo and think and pray for the innocent of that city. Call Mr. Eamon McCann. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. There's been widespread comment on the, uh, the fact of the supposed fact that uh, there's been a big disparity between the reaction of anti-war activists, sort of in the West and in this country and across the water, uh, a disparity between the reaction to the Russian uh, slaughter of uh, people in Aleppo on the one hand and various atrocities perpetrated by the West, in particular by the United States, uh, on the other. Where are the protesters outside the Russian embassy? It is asked. My opinion and the opinion of people before profit, that's a very good question. Very good question. It was that sort of a, a, that, a, a, the suggestion that there's no moral balance, the suggestion made on the left that there's no moral balance between the West and the Soviet Union is simply the mirror image of those who say and the representative in this House that they're quite happy to protest against Russia and to stand up and denounce the barbarism of Russian bombing and the same people have never, never protested against the genocidal slaughter of the Palestinian people by the Israelis using American and British supplied arms. When we look at what is happening in the Middle East today in Syria, we do see, of course, that the Russian uh, forces are adopting the same tactics and the same attitudes as they adopted in relation to Chechnya some years ago. And it is because they got away with the slaughter of the Chechen people that they think they can get away with it in Aleppo and in other parts uh, of the world. It is not an accident that Chechnya, per head of population, supplied more fighters to Islamic State than any other country in the world. That is, was a direct result of the Soviet Union and then the Russian suppression uh, uh, of the Chechen people. What we see now in the Middle East is the uh, use of Western arms, supplied mainly by the United States but also by uh, the United Kingdom, Western arms by Saudi Arabia to inflict horrendous slaughter, 4,000 civilians killed in Yemen. The majority of them, the substantial majority of them, killed with Western arms, supplied by companies like BAE, by Raytheon and the rest of them, without any protest. I call, people before profit calls, for the most vigorous protests outside the uh, Russian embassies and elsewhere against what is happening in Aleppo. We also call for a stepping up of protest against the supply of arms to the sectarian extremist state dictatorship of Saudi Arabia, which incidentally supplied 15 of the 19 Sept September the 11th uh, bombers, and yet, and yet, they are still supplied with billions of pounds worth of lethal machinery to slaughter people in the Middle East. Ask that the disparity must to end. I remarks. believe that, there, I'll just finish with this sentence, Mr. Speaker, we believe in people before profit that the Soviet Union was a state capitalist country, that we protested against the suppression and Czechoslovakia and so on and so Mr. forth. McCann, and today, time, time we have simultaneous demonstrations against time the Russians up. and the Americans. Members, that concludes this item.